Cacao is part of the genus Theobroma. And this plant, uh, the center of origin from this plant is the rainforest, the, the rainforest in southern, um, southern South America, northern rainforest, rainforest. This is highlighted in the map here by the red and black area. Uh, exploitation of this plant by exploitation of this plant by the natives has given rise to what we enjoy as chocolate today. So archaeological studies have um, found that cacao has been has been processed by the native people for over 5,000 years. Uh, this processing shows the long um, relationship we've been having with, with cacao, between, between cacao and, and humans for this long period of time. Uh, these pictures here show some of the tools used to process cacao um, during this period by the native peoples. So, cacao was then transported and cultivated throughout Mesoamerica. So Mesoamerica is what we consider as Southern Mexico today and the countries in Central America. So the Aztecs and Mayans uh, transported and cultivated the crop throughout this region. Now, the variety that they selected, they selected for based on the favorable flavor attributes. This variety is known today as Criollo and is still the, the variety with the best flavor attributes. How played an important role within Mesoamerican culture. So the pulp around the beans, they were um, fermented to make alcoholic beverages. The beans themselves were dried, roasted, and ground by the Mesoamerican people, then mixed with maize, cinnamon, and pepper to create a Mesoamerican chocolate drink. They also used um, cacao beans, and they also used cacao beans in as as a sorry. They also used cacao beans as a currency, and um, they also used cacao beans in religious rituals. Uh, there are a lot of throughout Mesoamerica, even today, there are a lot of uh, Mesoamerican artifacts that depict cacao as can be seen here, where the Lord of this time, um, of this time was having a discussion with one of his subjects. And of course, if you look to the bottom right of the artifact, you'll see cocoa pods being presented to this, to this arm lord. When the Spanish arrived in South America in the 1500s, uh, they were intrigued by the importance of cacao to the, to the Mesoamerican people of that time. Uh, what what they, they they noted one of the um, what, what they noted is that the large consumption of the Mesoamerican chocolate drink by Montezuma, the then Aztec ruler. Uh, while they found while the Europeans themselves found the, the Mesoamerican chocolate drink astringent, they soon realized that mixing the ground cocoa beans with cinnamon, vanilla, and sugar produced a drink that was favorable to them. Uh, that drink was soon exported to Spain and other countries throughout Europe, creating the first international market for cocoa beans. Of course, this led to the, the cultivation and propagation of cacao throughout the colonies, uh, particularly in the Caribbean region. So, in the 1700s, um, cacao was mainly produced within Caribbean and South American regions but uh, there were some natural disasters that affected cacao production. One of these disasters, one of these disasters occurred in, um, in, the, in the islands of Martinique, etc. Martinique and others where hurricanes um, ravaged these, these islands. Of course, something that is well known today. Uh, after the hurricane passed, most of the crop was, was of course destroyed, but there were some plants that survived and these plants were selected uh, to re repropagate the the plantations within the island, and they also shared it with other islands that were similarly devastated. Now, this, the, these varieties were no, are, are known to be a melanado, right? Within Trinidad, within the early 1700s, there was also a problem where 
pods were blackening and drying on the tree. And that significantly reduced the production of cacao in the island. Now, cacao was a very favorable, uh, cacao in Trinidad was very favorable to Europeans, was so favorable that um, they would they would sign contracts with the with the um with, uh, with, with the plantation owners um, to get the pods from the farms even before the um tree actually produced pods that was that favorable. So to mitigate the problem and to 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 of course um, boost production, what they did is um they collected uh, a harder harder variety from South America, what was known then as the Forestero variety, and they planted it within the Caribbean island of Trinidad to boost production. Now, this this con this um the hybridization between Forestero and Criollo formed the Trinitario variety, which of course is well known today. Then in the early 1900s, plant diseases of course had a part to play in the direction of um, cocoa farming, cocoa plantations. In Costa Rica, uh, at the time they were planting mostly bananas, but because of diseases, they, they lost approximately 90% of the production of bananas on the island and they were losing control. They, they did not know how to control the spread of this, this disease. So what they decided to do is to cut down the banana trees and replant it with other crops. One of the crops that they decided to plant it with was cacao. So what they did is they decided to go to the different um, Central American countries where the Mesoamericans would have planted um, the Puyo variety and they would assess these varieties for yield and flavor and bring those varieties back to the farm uh, managed then by the United Fruit Company. And this resulted in the United Fruit Collection in Costa Rica, which is now, which is now um, under the, the stewardship of Cati. In Trinidad, the, the witch's bloom disease was ravaging production again. So what they decided, what the um, a geneticist at the Imperial College of Agriculture, as what is known as a, the, the, the um, Faculty of Food and Agriculture today, he surveyed, he surveyed the nation for different varieties to see if he can identify a variety within the country that was sufficiently resistant to which is bloom disease. While he did not identify those, he, he did um, put together a collection of what is called the ICS clones today. Those ICS clones are important and play a role in breeding all over the world, particularly ICS 95 and ICS 1. Because he did not identify a variety that was sufficiently resistant to witch's broom, this led to the first major Amazon expedition in the 1930s to early 1940s. The purpose, of course, of the expedition was to collect different varieties, uh, to find one, one or a few varieties that were um, sufficiently resistant to witch's broom. Um, the, th that collection was, of course, brought to Trinidad and represented the first um, collection of different varieties that were brought to the country. They found the SEA 6 and SEA 12 varieties to be sufficiently resistant to witch's broom, and those varieties, of course, were also exported out. Later on, more, more um, expeditions into the Amazon at the, at the origin, by the origin of, um, of cacao in South America, led to more and more varieties being collected. These varieties are now stored at what is known as the International Cocoa Gene Bank in Trinidad. So, so before the 15th century, the Mesoamericans selected the Puyo variety, which is still an important variety today. Then in the 18th century, of course, there were uh, varieties were selected for vigor and hardness due to certain environmental conditions. And then in the 19th century, there was selection of varieties for disease resistance and yield. So, Moving on now, let me talk about the, the coconut with market. So these are the countries currently within the Latin America and Caribbean region that produce um, that produce cacao. Uh, collectively, we represent 17, approximately 17% 17 of global cacao production. There's also the production by Africa, the African continent, which represents 17, 76 percent of global um, cacao production and, and the Asia and Oceania 
our lesions, which represents about 6%. So I was used in the, of course, as an alkali for soap making, fertilizers, baking of biscuits and bread, cosmetics and pharmaceutical products. But of course, the main driver of the market is chocolate. So the cow market, the, the cocoa market is, is today worth approximately US $2 billion per year. And the chocolate market is worth more than US $100 billion per year. So it's a very lucrative um, market and supports um, a lot of rural, um, um, rural areas throughout the cacao producing regions. In the 1980s, manufacturing of chocolate was mainly, was mainly done in Europe. So they would of course benefit from that lucrative chocolate market. However, B, as you can see, um, split, split and processing is distributed throughout the uh, producing regions as well as Europe. So while Europe still accounts for most of chocolate, most of the chocolate processing at, at about 38%, the Americas, Asia, and Africa account for each about 20% 20, 20 of the production of, of chocolate globally. So, However, what we're seeing is that the consumption is mainly is, is mainly done is, is highest in the European countries. So what that means is that European countries represent the most lucrative market for selling your chocolates, right? What you also see is that what you also see is that um, the consumption um, is estimated to increase three percent per year. So as we all can attest, you know, there are a lot of products. Now with chocolate in it, um, and also of course chocolate consumption itself. So that represents a lucrative increase and a lucrative market for not just not just European chocolate processors, but also those in countries like Trinidad and Tobago and throughout our region. Chocolates have become an important part of our diet due to increasing um, consumption. However, chocolate products have been shown to contribute approximately 4.3% to cadmium dietary exposure in Europe. We highlight Europe because, as I just showed, they, uh, they consume the most amount of chocolate globally. But what is cadmium and how does it affect us? Cadmium is a metal element similar to zinc, nickel, manganese. A metal element is one that is shiny, malleable, and it conducts heat and electricity well. And typically at room temperature, it's um, in a solid state. So as you can see from the top left, we have nickel, then copper, zinc. At the bottom left, we have palladium, then silver, then cadmium. So you get an idea as to what the metal is. Cadmium is naturally found within soils. It's not associated with phosphates, etc. So it is something that um, is unavoidable or it's unavoidable to, to have cadmium within all foodstuffs. Cadmium is used, is used um, globally and in a lot of things that we use day to day. So it, it was used, it was used in um, rechargeable batteries, nickel zinc, nickel cadmium rechargeable batteries that is being phased out due to the, um, of course, the toxic effects of cadmium. But it is still used today to coat um, planes and the oil platforms to prevent um, rusting. However, this metal is not essential to plants or animals. So, contamination of the soils by this metal occurs naturally through things like volcanic eruptions. So, for instance, if most of all of us would remember the eruption at the Lassoufre volcano, where even here in Trinidad, we were getting ash from that vol volcano. Uh, so that ash you now would spread, while it would spread nutrients as well to, to the soils, it will also spread um, cadmium because cadmium is of course a metal that is natural within the, within the environment. However, due to the many uses of cadmium, uh, improper disposal of, improper disposal of trash leads to the contamination of, of, of the soils uh, by, by cadmium because of man-made interventions. 
is also cadmium contamination in fertilizers. So for instance, phosphate fertilizers, because cadmium is found naturally associated in the soil with phosphates, when people mine for these phosphates to make fertilizers, um, there's sometimes there can be a significant amount of cadmium contamination within them. Then of course, fossil fuel emissions as well to contaminate the environment with cadmium. Now the con contamination of the environment with cadmium leads to higher cadmium concentrations in the soils globally. The, con the higher contamination of these soils leads to plant uptake of cadmium because plant is so similar to the metals that we need, that the plant needs, that, that we need. So for instance, the plant needs zinc, nickel, manganese, copper, because cadmium is so similar to these uh, metals. It's hard for the plant to distinguish between the essential metals and the metals that are not essential like cadmium. So cadmium is also taken up by the plant. And once cadmium is taken up by a plant, of course, it, re it enters into our diet, right? So that is the mode of entry into, however, the plant, as well as humans, we have mechanisms that can store cadmium safely so it does not damage us and affect us. However, if cadmium concentration is too high, cadmium contamination is high, leading to very high cadmium concentrations in the foodstuffs, um, it could result in the, over time, the surpassing of the threshold and our threshold to safely store cadmium. And this was, this was um, deduced to be the reason for the, what was later termed the Itai Itai disease in Japan. Where it, where it is that cadmium poisoning by mining um, mining companies. So they, they were just dumping the effluent into the rivers and of course into the environment. Poisoned the, agri the, the, the agricultural farms nearby and people were consuming these, these um, crops with high levels of cadmium. And they were able to deduce that because of the high concentrations of cadmium in the soil, they developed these diseases later on in life. So takes about 30, uh, 30 years to develop these diseases of contaminate of, of 30 years of, of um, taking in high foods with high amounts of cadmium. Right? But it's high, it's high disease is typically um, a, a very extreme result of cadmium poisoning. What typically happens is um, result in liver and kidney diseases and also with cancer in the lungs so smokers because tobacco is what we consider a hyperaccumulator of cadmium. So it takes up a, a lot more cadmium into the plant than other um, plants. And not only just takes it up, but it, it's able to store it safely. That means that um, you won't see any toxic effects uh, despite the high levels of cadmium within the plant. Uh, smokers now are exposed to that high level of cadmium and has been associated with cancer in the lungs, but also in, in non-smokers, cancer in the endometrium, bladder, and breasts. So because they were able to show that cadmium poisoning resulted in these diseases, regulatory bodies were formed. So in the European Food Safety Authority, what's in Europe, and the Codex Alimentarius. So the Codex Alimentarius is a global body. And I believe in 1995, they signed a, a treaty with over probably about 160 countries then. So I'm, and I'm sure by now the participants has increased under the, so, so they are under the FAO and H and WHO and they regulate, they set the, um, the regulatory levels of contaminants within foodstuffs. So when you're, when you're trading with certain foodstuffs, if it is that it's being regulated, it will be regulated by Equix Alimentarius. And if, you are outside of or above the regulatory limit, you would not be able to ship your products to the other countries. So as global consumption of chocolate has increased and split products contribute 4.3% to cadmium dietary exposure in Europe, the EFSE and Codex Alimentarius set maximum allowable levels of cadmium and chocolate products. They set because the, um, what, they found, what we found is that um, Cadmium in, in chocolate products is based on the cadmium in the cocoa beans itself. They set the regulatory levels based on the cocoa solids percentage, right? That means that to reduce, that definitely means that to reduce the, the cadmium within the chocolate product, you'll have to reduce the amount of cadmium within the plant itself. 
what does that mean for us? So it's a regional issue. It's a regional issue because what the codex alimentarius reported this year is that the cadmium regulations um, will result in approximately 13% of chocolate products being rejected from going to other countries like Europe, of course, in more lucrative markets. And of course, that will affect um, foreign exchange based on the based on cacao itself. And uh, within the Caribbean, it's set to affect 7.3%. So it's still so it, it plays a major role in, in terms of foreign exchange um, uh, for an exchange earning with for this for, for these products. However, as the rest of the cacao producing world, they do not expect these new cadmium regulations to affect um, the market access market accessibility um, for these products. So it really is a regional issue. And these these um these maximum allowable levels set by these, these, these trade regulatory bodies will of course reduce the access to the more lucrative chocolate market. So what we see, and as I said before, is that uh, the cacao producing countries are now actually processing and making chocolates. And if you can get that chocolate into other markets, of course, you tend to earn your earnings, of course, will increase from, from the 2 billion market to the over 100 billion market per year. Um, then it will also result in the re reduced price for cocoa beans. So for instance, if they're trading just in cocoa beans, um, someone might be willing to accept the beans with the high cadmium levels at a much, at a much reduced price. And then over there, they can, they can mix it with other beans that are very low to make the chocolate products that, chocolate products that fall within the standards necessary. Of course, that has a cascading effect that can result in reduced cacao production in these regions. So, some of the solutions. So, with all these problems, of course, we must come up with solutions because you can see the importance of accessing the cocoa and chocolate, ma chocolate markets at the highest price possible. So, some of the short term solutions is um, studies have shown that application of lime and biochar reduce cadmium uptake and uh, applying these during pod development can reduce the amount of cadmium going into the beans, which of course will make the, will, will increase the accessibility of, um, of cadmium within the regions that, within the regions that are high cadmium regions. They can also mix high and low cadmium beans to reduce overall cadmium levels. So while it is, we, the, the problem is a regional one. Um, there are a lot of areas within Latin America and within the Caribbean where cadmium accumulation is low. So even within, for instance, Trinidad, you know, we have a very small problem in terms of cadmium where within the Northeast, a small area in the Northeast, we are finding um, high, cad high cadmium beans. So if, if um, farmers were to come together and decide to mix these beans are the proportion that can reduce the, 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 cadmium, the cadmium levels in the overall um, batch. It can result in, of course, increase still accessing that high level price, um, at that high level price in those markets that are lucrative. And then, of course, identify low cadmium re regions within each country for preferential cacao farming. Of course, that's a, a no brainer. Additionally, the medium and long-term results, what we see, what, what we like to do is identify varieties that have take low cadmium levels and use these varieties as rootstocks and grafting to reduce the amount of cadmium that is taken up by the plant. So um, studies have already uh, been already underway and at, at the Cocoa Research Center in UV, we have been pioneering those, those, those studies and identified low uptake in cadmium varieties and are working to evaluate them and, and develop uh, toolkits that can introduce these, these, these varieties as graft, as, as rootstock for farmers. For the long term, of course, if you identify varieties that uptake and partition low cadmium levels to the beans of the plant, 
you can use it in, in breeding to breed a new commercial variety. Because cacao is a tree crop, um, this will take a long time, so 30 to 50 years. Um, it will likely it will likely take to develop a variety that we are sure that of course has other um, preferential attributes to plant within farms, but that as well is 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 ongoing. So in 1985, the then head of the Cook Research Unit, which is now the Cook Research Center, said the future will inevitably hold new problems of diseases, pests, environmental, and cultural practices. All of these are quite unpredictable and re will require novel cocoa genotypes to solve them. The value of any individual genotype in the future cannot be predicted by its reaction to present problems. So at the Cocoa Research Center, which of course was then the Cocoa Research Unit, we are custodians of the International Cocoa Gene Bank in Trinidad, and it contains over 2,000 varieties of cacao, representing the largest public collection of varieties in the world. So screening those varieties, as I said, we identified um, low cadmium uptake in varieties, and we're hoping to evaluate um, how these varieties perform um, and how they can add to the reducing the, the toolkit of reducing cadmium accumulation, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but across the region. So for the 15th century, um, the the Aztecs and Mayans, they selected the Puro variety for flavor. Uh, this variety, as I said, is still the premier variety for flavor in the world. Then in the 18th century, um, varieties were selected for vega and hardness um, due to environmental conditions. And in the 19th century, um, varieties were selected for disease resistance and yield. So throughout time, for every, whether it be just for, um, for, for flavor or to mitigate a problem, they have selected varieties that have, that, that, that have given us the, the ability to continue propagating this, this crop and, and, increase, um, and increase our production throughout the world. Selecting a variety now, the 20th century, um, for low cadmium uptake and accumulation is current problem. And as Mr. Kennedy, uh, Dr. Kennedy said, um, it we, we will we will be able to identify new varieties, new genotypes that can mitigate this problem and be shared with those across the region right from right here in Trinidad and Tobago. So that's my presentation and like um, this is a list of the references. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and I'm welcoming any questions at this time.